Hello there, good evening. Folche Goji on Laura Lynn Show is Misha Anton O'Moraku. Good evening, welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Live Irish Schmidt's episode number 167. Tonight we are reading the second and concluding part of Bekuva of the White Skin, which we began a couple of weeks ago. And uh, finally getting around to finishing it off now. Hope everybody is keeping well. We are streaming simultaneously on the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. If you're watching there, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for updates about new streams and videos, which are quite regular these days. We're also streaming on the main Mythical Ireland Facebook page over at Mythical Ireland. Uh, sorry, facebook.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. If you're joining us, uh, no matter where you are, please do say hello uh we like to say hello back to people and uh, do, 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 sorry need to where is the chat gone oh melanap has changed again ah oh, there we go i apologize for the uh, technical hitches starting a little bit late this evening john McHugh is the first in the house she's watching on the aforementioned youtube channel yo from hoth from dumb dumb Cruthen. Hello, Joan. Good evening. Daisy Peters is in Rio in Brazil. Hello, Daisy. Good afternoon to you. Sandra Boothroyd is in the house. Sandra, it's very good to see you. Bernadine is in, or Bernadette even, is in Maine. Hello, Bernadette. Good afternoon to you. Stephen Walker, greetings from a dreary Atlanta. Well, it was a bit dreary. Well, it was kind of cloudy and windy and a bit rainy at times and a bit sunny at times here. Typical Irish day, in other words. Uh, very good to hear from you, Stephen. Jules Cousins is in the house. Slauncha, Jules, uh, you're very welcome to the stream. Uh, uh, Jane Wynn is in a cold Hampshire on the English Channel. Keep wrapped up. Well, look, come here, listen. I hope that you're sitting in front of a fire with the feet up and a nice cup of tea in the hand or something stronger if that's your, you know, if that's what you like. Maybe a glass of white or red. Bottle of white, bottle of red. Maybe a bottle of rosé instead. Who's the first to guess who that is? Anne McCallum. Hello, Anton on the mighty tour. Hope everyone is warm and well. We'll definitely pledge to read and also to join you on the 25th of February. Yes, more about that and on. Thank you, Anne. And good to see you. Joe Butler is in a sunny but brisk Colorado. Sounds a little bit Irish. Joe, you're very welcome. Salve says, Banathi Glorvar in on Ari Ditch. Uh, Anthony, uh, Anton Agus Natua Ella uh, Falsha Salve, you're very welcome this evening John Main, is it in a cold and wet bell mullet which is in the county of Mayo John, very very good to see you Nick Eska Casterton is in the house, yes made it good evening Anthony and the wonderful two, I hope you're all safe and well well, we are, I think well I am, and I hope you are too Nick good to see you, Mavanway Millward evening everyone, I'm sorry it's been so long I've been missing my weekly dose of Mythflix great to be back, always a pleasure to welcome you back into the library, Mavanway. Anna L says, good evening to Anthony and the Tua. Falja Trenonoa, Catherine Woodruff is in the house, ready for a treasured Monday story. Brilliant stuff. Janet Moran is in Boston. That wonderful place that's half American, half Irish. Good evening, Janet. Rex Fortenberry is in Baton Rouge in Louisiana. Rock on Tua. We will, we will rock you. No guesses, no prizes for whoever guesses that. Stephen O'Hara is in Dublin tonight, rather than Kilkenny for change. I wonder, are you partying? Are you dressed up for the occasion, Stephen? It's good to see you. Desiree Riley is in the house, driving back to Colorado, so I can't talk much, but I'm listening. Well, I hope that we can keep up your focus on the road. The main thing is that you stay safe on your journey, Desiree, but it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Wayne Bird is in Birmingham. Hello to all our friends across the uh, Irish Sea in Birmingham. And uh, Salav is in uh, Tyrone, or Tyr Tyr Owen. Is there any literature on the Tua de Danon coming back? Aha, you have uh, 7 7 is asking on YouTube. You must troll through many previous episodes of Live Irish Myths. There is tons of it. Dia Ditch As Alaska says Shannon Donahue. A good is it morning time there or is it around noon? I think it might be morning time. Shannon, it's very good of you to join us, and I uh, hope it's not too cold over there. Archaeoastronomy database is in the house. I'm sorry I missed your. I think you were streaming. I'm going to catch up on that later. But uh, 
looked and sounded very interesting. Dolmac McDermott is in the house. Hi, Anthony Agasantua. Dolmac, what a great pleasure. A grand pleasure it is. Uh, how are you? Bernie Courtney is in a breezy castle bar. Uh, well, can't you see the lovely stretch in the evenings that we're having? Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, didn't get dark until about, completely dark until about quarter past six this evening. So spring is in the air. St. Bridget may have waved her magic wand in bulk. Blessings of the season to all of you. Uh, Nora Gaffney, Gia Yiv, Galair, Acharja, a lovely sunny beach today. Glad to hear it, Nora. I wonder what the sea was like, cold and salty, I reckon. Speaking of which, I saw that the Canadians have named, I think it's the Canadians, have named their snow plows for the uh, winter season. One of them is called Control Salt Delete. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> uh, Barbara Barney says, hi, everyone. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Barbara. Falcha. Helen Hirsch Chatter is in the house. And uh, it's a great pleasure to see you. Billy Joel, absolutely 100% correct. What is it called? Scenes from an Italian restaurant. Yes, indeed. Brilliant song. Maria Gutzeit is in Koblenz in Germany. Good evening, Maria. You're very welcome. Uh, is it Willkommen? I, you'll have to forgive me. I have about 10 words of German. Uh, Brian Callback is in Spain. Lucky you. And what's the weather like there? Warm and sunny, I hope. Susan Scott is in snowy northwest Connecticut. Susan, very good of you to join us. Hope you're having a great afternoon. Brendan Byrne. Facebook had the stutters, but appears to have settled down. Fingers crossed. Steve Martinson, of course, Brendan is in uh, the Valley of the Two Lakes, Glendaloch. Hello from Monona, Wisconsin, with 24 degrees here today. I love you all. I think, is that 24 Fahrenheit? It's hardly 24 Celsius, is it? S Steve, great to see you. EDT is in the house. Hello to a, a very warm morning here. Brilliant stuff. And uh, you're down under, ED, I believe. And I uh, hope you have a great day. Happy Tuesday to you. Barb Jordan is in a freezing New York. Barb, very good of you to join us. And Janet was in second with Billy Joel. Nora thinks it's a musical. <laughs> it's not a very, you wouldn't want to pay for a musical with me as the star. I can tell you that for nothing. Susan Scott uh, appears to be indicating that drinks are definitely in order. Michael Pike says greetings to all. Hello, Michael. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, Joan says, don't mention red wine. I opened a reserve red for 2013 and the first taste was fit for my mower, petrol. However, no, it's delicious. <laughs> well, enjoy it. Uh, Ashling Kane is in Florida. Good afternoon to you, Ashling. I uh, hope uh, all our friends in uh, Miami and Cape Canaveral and all those lovely places and uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are, are feeling uh, great. And Scott Doherty is in Southern Southern. <laughs> Southern Oregon. I haven't had a drop, by the way, <laughs> unless you count tea. Um, yes, and you're very welcome. Good to see you in the house. Uh, yes, indeed, Salve. I have. What a what a wonderfully brilliant song. The full Irish Gary is in the house. I visited Glen Druid Dolman today. Ten minutes in Cherrywood, fifty ton capstone, an amazing place to visit. Is that the one that's under threat from all the development? I wonder. Adrian Beglin is in the house. Hello, Adrian uh, Falcha. And uh, that was a wonderful story you told me earlier on. Tom King, hello there. Anthony and all the friends of the two, a best hour of the day. Good fire going and it's story time. Pure heaven. Brilliant stuff, Tom. Glad to hear it. Sure, look, at least you'll keep warm. And uh, you have a bit of company now. Other than Lyric FM, it has to be said. Adele Perth, good morning. Adele is in Adelaide, I think, isn't it? Or is it Melbourne? Adelaide, I think. Adele, a very good morning to you. Happy Tuesday to you and all our friends down under. Alison Clipsham is in Leicester. Horrible cold means I get to lie down and watch. There's worse things you could be doing, I can tell you. Um, Nora Gaffney O'Connor ordered her Triscoll. That is uh, something we will talk about momentarily. You will see the ticker is still going at the bottom. That uh, major announcement. That we made last week still stands until the 28th of february sue printer is in the house hello sue welcome 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 carol barrett happy in bulk to all the tour great stretch in the evening good to be back on a live always a pleasure to see you in the library carol sit comfortably make yourself warm and cozy and i hope that the story uh, is uh, suitable <laughs> for your tastes tom lawler is in tipperary hello to all yes indeed tom 
Good evening to you. Bernie Courtney says, as the days uh, as the days lengthen, the cold strengthens. Well, that's the thing at this time of year. We couldn't rule out a bit of snow. It's been known to snow on St. Patrick's Day. In fact, we had the Beast in the East in 2018. It was known to snow at the end of March and the beginning of April. Patricia McAteer is hoping the wind behaves, but I'll catch up. Keeps doing what it's doing now. Patricia, it's good to see you. I hope life is treating you well. Peter Flanagan is in Southampton. Hello, Peter. A, a great uh, maritime uh, town, of course, with associations with White Star Line and Titanic and all that. Oh, Tarini Pendleton is saying hello from Laguna Beach, which is in California. Well, well, you're all very welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are uh, going to conclude our story of Vancouver of the white skin this evening before we do that a few announcements you may have seen if you got time the video before we came on here on the youtube channel and the mythical ireland facebook page and the mythical ireland community and the mythical ireland creatives group announcing that i have been uh, well i've taken up the very kind invitation uh, to be a reading ambassador for ireland reads which this year takes place on friday the 25th of february the purpose of that day, of course, is to just get people reading, reading books, the old fashioned way, pick up a book and leaf through the pages and just get lost in it, you know, open the mind, relax, maybe get some education too. I'm going to be doing a live stream that day and planning to do what I did last year, a three hour reading session. Wow, I know, glutton for punishment and all that, like I don't enjoy it or anything like that. But um, I hope you can join us then. And if you can't, even better again because that's your excuse to pick up a book and do your own bit of reading don't forget to pledge your uh, 10 minutes if you want an hour 10 hours 24 hours if you like of reading over at irelandreads.ie uh, we mentioned tom king of course um thank you to those who have ordered uh, through the mythical ireland website some of tom's wonderful uh, uh, creations the uh, I have one of his swan spiral pendants on me, as it happens. I also have my Mythical Ireland letter opener right here, uh, which uh, was the first. This was not exactly the prototype, but this was the first of the production line. Not that Tom has a production line, all handcrafted. And the uh, the Triscoll. Oh, yeah, don't want to knock the pens over. Hang on now. We'll have to show you just in case you haven't seen one. And here's the beautiful Triscoll, the tri-spiral. Very, very beautifully crafted and created. Again, all handmade by Tom at his forge in the heart of the Boyne Valley on the smooth road, Bohermeen, near Navan in the county of Meath, the centre of Ireland. Look, I mean, psychologically and spiritually speaking, I mean, we all know Ishnock is the real centre of Ireland. <laughs> Actually, we all know Drogheda is, but don't tell the folks in Ishnock. So those are the three items, the Swan Spiral Pendant, the Mythical Ireland Letter Opener, and the Triscoll. If you order one or more of those items through the Mythical Ireland website between now and the 28th of February, you will be entered into a draw for that wonderfully beautiful prize uh, of the uh, handcrafted steel uh, St. Bridget's Cross, which was the first and only one thus far made by Mr. King on Gawa in his forge in Bohermine. If you're confused as to where to go, it's very straightforward. It's mythicalireland.com. And in the menu, you'll see gallery and shop. When you click that, there's a drop down that says on Gawa Creations. Go in there and you'll be able to select your item. And it, everything is packaged very, very lovingly and carefully. All of those who have received their item so far have commented on it. Tom takes a lot of care and attention in his packaging. Everything is sent by registered post, not normal post. So the items are uh, for the Swan Spiral Pendant is 40 euros plus postage and uh, plus registered postage and packaging. For the Mythical Ireland Letter Opener, it's 50 euros plus registered postage and packaging. And for the large Triscoll, it's 100 euros plus registered postage and packaging. But as I say, with the added bonus that you get entered into a draw, we will do that draw on the 28th of February in the evening time, uh, live here on the Mythical Ireland uh, social media channels i really look forward to that and i wish you all every one of you the very best of luck one more announcement uh before uh, 
couple of people have mentioned Facebook feed is a little bit glitchy. Adele Perth tells us it's 6.45 a.m. and it's already 29 Celsius. I'm not jealous or anything. Totally jealous. Adele, enjoy every moment of it. One more announcement. Uh, as, uh, as in my ends, a box containing a few books. You will recognize this book, I hope. So this is a, it's kind of a little bit emotional, maybe. I don't know. I don't intend to cry or anything, but uh, this is definitely a. Okay. Apparently, Facebook is buffering. I look. You know yourself. I. I this is out of my hands. So head on over to uh, YouTube, folks. If you're on Facebook, apparently it's buffering quite badly. It's a funny thing. You see, Melonap sends the feed to YouTube and Facebook simultaneously. It's only uh, the Facebook that's having a problem. So head on over to the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel. I have in my hands New Grange Monument to Immortality. This is my book about New Grange, which was first published all the way back in 2012, which if you do a quick bit of maths, and if you watch the live stream with Tom, you'll know that my maths aren't very good at all. But I think if you take 2012 from 2022, you get 10. So it's 10 years old this year. And here's the announcement. Oh, people are leaving because Facebook is fecked up. Facebook. Would somebody send a letter to Mark Z Has anybody got Mark Zuck Zuckerface's um, phone number? Give him a buzz and tell him this isn't good enough. Live Irish Mits is being interrupted. Head on over to YouTube if you can. Um, anyway, I have eight copies of this. They were sent to me in a box from the uh, distributor today. Eight copies. These are the last eight copies of Newgrange Monument to Immortality. When these eight are gone, that will be it. And why do I speak with such confidence? That is because it, with the agreement of myself, my publisher has decided that Newgrange Monument to Immortality will not be reprinted. So if you want a signed copy, head on over to mythicalireland.com, gallery and shop, my books, and order yourself. Get in quick. There are only eight left. And when they're gone, they're gone. And I mean it from the bottom of my heart. They are gone and it will be no more. And when they're gone, it will disappear from the website because it ain't been reprinted. Now, uh, there is an upside to that. And that is, I do have plans for a fairly substantial project, which I'm not at liberty to disclose at this time. All I can say in relation to that is, uh, in 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 time, I will reveal that probably to the patrons first. So do uh, please consider becoming a patron of Mythical Ireland at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. The patrons are regularly treated to some exclusives and some special stuff, including blog posts and videos and podcasts and all that sort of thing. Um, so there is a, another substantial project uh, in relation to Newgrange down the line it's not going to happen today or tomorrow or next month uh but suffice to say that i i, I am saddened that uh you know the new grange book is not going to be reprinted however the decision was a, a joint one because uh, my publisher did offer to reprint it but the difficulty is that it needs to be rewritten because we've learned so much about Newgrange in the past 10 years and the people who built it, that it it's the the information is kind of out of date. It was written for 10 years ago. Uh, you know, we had, you know, um, we had a different opinion about things back then based on the available evidence. The available evidence has amassed over the last decade and now 
uh, Newgrange Monument to immortality, although much of it is still very relevant and still very accurate. Some of it uh, needs to be updated or uh, expunged. <laughs> well, I did mention that last year or the year before when we spoke about uh, the uh, the wonderful new evidence emerging. Um, so uh, Annette Purd is in the house and is saying it's frustrating. Yes, head on over to YouTube, folks. YouTube is the place to be tonight. Absolutely. If you can, uh, you should have, I mean, you should be able to watch it without probably, it was easy to create an account, but if you have a Gmail address, it's easy. Or you might have the YouTube app on your phone. It should only take you a minute to download it and install it. So Newgrange, after, uh, uh, after those eight copies are gone, is gone. It will be a thing of the past. Jules is saying the packaging is amazing, as is the workmanship. Talking about Tom King, of course, brilliant stuff. Mavanway is hopping on over to YouTube. I think that's a good plan. Brendan Byrne wants to know if Glenn the Lock is not the centre of Ireland. Hey, I'm not being subjective. I'm just saying Boyne Valley needs, you know, you know, it's a close second. It's a close second. Uh, DBD X Veggie S X N J is saying peace and love to my Irish people from NJNY. Is that New Jersey, New York? Uh, very good evening to you, whatever your name is. <laughs> yes, lots of people commenting on Facebook freezing. Very sorry. Nothing I can do. Apologies. Anyway, uh, it will be available. Hopefully a clean version of the live stream will be available on YouTube afterwards. If you're not able to head on over there now, we'll share that later on. Anyway, better get with the reading. <sighs> Yes. Uh, Patricia McAteer is one of the sensible ones who switched to YouTube. Much better. Okay. Brilliant stuff. Great, great, great. And DC is reminding us that the Hill of Ishnach is the centre of Ireland. Well, I did kind of say that, didn't I? Chapter 7. Is everybody settled and relaxed? Well, I hope so. I'm very, very sorry about Facebook. Facebook, Facebook. You know what I mean? Mark Zuckerface, give him an email, an angry email. Write him a letter. Tell him it's not good enough. Anyway, let us proceed. Desiree is asking, does that mean that Finn will be making a special guest appearance to pull the name out of the hat? What a tremendously brilliant idea, Desiree. Yes, I think that's exactly what we will do. Yeah, good stuff. All looking good on YouTube. Brilliant stuff. Anne Mavanway has made it across to YouTube as well. Brilliant. Sorry, and uh, Jules, I should have said. Excellent. Right, let's get going. Because, like, we've been talking. Well, I have for 23 minutes. You guys have been falling asleep. It wouldn't be the first time I was accused of talking SH1T. Anyway, Chapter 7. On reaching the palace, Con called his magicians and poets to a council and informed them that he had found the boy they sought, the son of a virgin. Uh, Salav is saying that it's uh, just a busy time for evening upload lives and traffic of jam servers is often the cause. Probably, yeah. Bernie Manley says, YouTube is great here. Brilliant stuff, Bernie. Wherever here is, you're very welcome. <laughs> Saibi is commenting that... Uh, Mr. Zucker, 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 Zucker Hamburger, his shares are collapsing on Facebook. These learned people consulted together and they stated that the young man must be killed and that his blood should be mixed with the earth of Tara and sprinkled under the withered trees. When Zegda heard this, he was astonished and defiant. Then, seeing that he was alone and without prospect of succor, he grew downcast and was in great fear for his life. But remembering the safeguards under which he had been placed, he enumerated these to the assembly and called on the High King to grant him the protections that were his due. I need to put the glasses on. Uh, Joan knows this story well because of the Hoth connection. Yes, indeed. Indeed, brilliant. There are still some people watching on Facebook. Um, 
hopefully it'll rectify itself. Con was greatly perturbed, but as in duty bound, he placed the boy under the various protections that were in his oath. And with the courage of one who has no more to gain or lose, he placed Segda furthermore under the protection of all the men of Ireland. But the men of Ireland refused to accept that bond, saying that although the Ard Ree was acting justly towards the boy, he was not acting justly towards Ireland. Remember, we're not exactly in a situation of democracy in medieval Ireland, but nor are we necessarily in a situation of dictatorship. The king could be ousted by the people, especially if the land was seen to degrade or to be suffering from, you know, uh, you know, bad weather, um, failure of the harvest, blight on the crops or that sort of thing. And in fact, the king could be killed by the people if such a thing was to happen. We do not wish to slay this prince for our pleasure, they argued, but for the safety of Ireland, he must be killed. Stout argument there, huh? Angry parties were formed. Hmm. That's reminiscent of today's, uh, well, a healthy democracy has uh, lots of naysayers in it. Uh, but the angry mobs not are not so much a uh, healthy part of democracy, I don't think. Depends on what they do with their anger, doesn't it? Art and Fionn, the son of Ull, that's Fionn McCool to you and I, and the princes of the land were outraged at the idea that one who had been placed under the, their protection should be hurt by any hand. But the men of Ireland and the magicians stated that the king had gone to fairy, that's the she, for a special purpose, and that his acts outside or contrary to that purpose were illegal and committed no person to obedience. There were debates in the council hall, in the marketplace, in the streets of Tara, some holding that national honour dissolved and absolved all personal honour, and others protesting that no man had aught but his personal honour, and that above it not the gods, not even Ireland, should be placed. For it is to be known that Ireland is a god. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes, there's an old story that has made the rounds over the last couple of years, especially during the pandemic, that uh, Jesus was searching for God and couldn't find him anywhere. And one day he stumbled across him in Connemara in Ireland. And he said, goodness me, I've been looking for you everywhere. You know, what are you doing? And God said, working from home, son, working from home. Such a debate was in course, and Segda, to whom both sides addressed gentle and courteous arguments, grew more and more disconsolate. Well, it's all right being uh, gentle and courteous, uh, but not if, you, if you're about to uh, chop the, the uh, gentleman's head off. Yes, indeed, Joan McHugh reminds us that Ireland is a goddess, actually. Eru, thank you for that, Joan. Yes, indeed. Uh, Snapper Earl is saying hello from the recently electrified Hudson Valley. Brilliant stuff. New York State. Uh, very good to see you, Snapper Earl. Adina Sparks. Had to spend the morning at the vet's office. Hope nothing too serious. But uh, you're very, very welcome along. <laughs> but is it backyard snow? Says watching and working. Must confess, more of the former than the latter. <laughs> well, conceal your identity so your boss doesn't know what you're doing. <laughs> uh, brilliant. A Cy B is saying he just bought one, so seven left. I presume that's a Newgrange Monument Immortality. They're going fast, folks. And when they're gone, they're gone. And I mean it, that's not just an advertising slogan. You shall die for Ireland, dear heart, said one of them. And he gave Segda three kisses on each cheek. And I'm sure that was a massive consolation to the young man who was about to be assassinated. 
Indeed, said Segda, returning those kisses. Indeed, I had not bargained to die for Ireland, but only to bathe in her waters and to remove her pestilence. Yes, that 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 joke is a superb one. Working from home. Yep. Yes, indeed. But, dear child and prince, said another, kissing him, likewise, if any one of us could save Ireland by dying for her, how cheerfully we would die. <laughs> Jane Wynn says, my face is frozen for a second. This is very amusing. <laughs> I can imagine the sort of expressions that are uh, uh, being frozen uh, on the screen. Lorna Lowe is in Canada. A very good afternoon, Lorna. You're very welcome to Live Irish Mits. And Segda, returning his three kisses, agreed that the death was noble, but that it was not in his undertaking. Then, <laughs> that's what you'll need when you're dead, an undertaker. Never mind, that was a poor joke. Then, observing the stricken countenances about him and the faces of men and women hewn thin by hunger, his resolution melted away, and he said, I think I must die for you. And then he said, I will die for you. Sylvia Sanchez is saying hello from Clare, from County Clare. Hello, Sylvia. Um, Mavanway says the jokes have got a, a bit better since she's been away. I'm delighted to hear it. The uh, members of my crossword club um, have been leaving and it's been leaving people quite irate. We're three down and two are cross. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, just 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 when I was getting praise for jokes I had to tell that one never mind yes um small van big world is watching from YouTube brilliant stuff and Sylvia is also on YouTube and uh, Nora is uh, welcoming people to the YouTube uh, gathering yes indeed and when he had said that all the people present touched his cheek with their lips and the love and peace of Ireland entered into his soul so that he was tranquil and proud and happy. The executioner drew his wide, thin blade, and all those present covered their eyes with their cloaks. When a wailing voice called on the executioner to delay yet a moment, the high king uncovered his eyes and saw that a woman had approached driving a cow before her. Sorry, there's another joke there that I couldn't remember. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a picture of Richard III, you know. I've put up a marquee in my garden with funky music and flashing lights. Now is the winter of my disco tent. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Mavanwe, uh, the perfect answer, spoke too soon. <laughs> I hired a landscape gardener. But he said he was not of no use to me. Why? <laughs> because my garden was portrait. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll carry on. I do apologize. I know you're here for the stories, not for the jokes. If you had a choice, I would be in a pillory and you would be chucking uh, rotten fruit and tomatoes and all sorts of things at me. Why are you killing the boy? She demanded. This is the woman driving the cow before her. The reason for this slaying was explained to her. Are you sure, she asked, that the poets and magicians really know everything? Do they not? The king inquired. Do they? She insisted. And then turning to the magicians, let one magician of the magicians tell me what is hidden in the bags that are lying across the back of my cow. But no magician could tell it nor did they try to. <laughs> Another taxi for Murphy. <laughs> well, thank you, Backyard Snow, who laughed out loud. Uh, must not attract attention in the office. I'll try not to tell any more hilarious jokes from my repertoire. <clears throat> Questions are not answered thus, they said. There are formulae and the calling up of spirits and lengthy, complicated preparations in our art. 
I am not badly learned in these arts, said the woman, and I say that if you slay this cow, the effect will be the same as if you had killed the boy. We would prefer to kill a cow or a thousand cows rather than harm this young prince, said Con. But if we spare the boy, will these evils return? They will not be banished until you have banished their cause. And what is their cause? Bekuva is the cause and she must be banished. If you must tell me what to do, said Con, tell me at least to do something that I can do. I will tell you certainly, you can keep Bekuva and your ills as long as you want to. It does not matter to me. Come, my son, she said to Segda, for it was Segda's mother who had come to save him. And then that sinless queen and her son went back to their home of enchantment leaving the king and Fionn and the magicians and nobles of Ireland astonished and ashamed. Yes, uh, Karima is uh, pointing out that the subtitles are a big joke. Yes. Uh, is that YouTube or f uh, Facebook? Is it? Uh, Don't even turn them on. They're hilarious. Yes. Well, actually, if you want added hilarity, turn them on. But Joe Butler seems to be enjoying the jokes. Good stuff, Joe. Brilliant. I'll give you that tenor later on. <laughs> Nora wants it to stop. <sighs> You're all jealous. Because of my wonderful repertoire of brilliant jokes. <laughs> Chapter 8. There are good and evil people in this and in every other world. And the person who goes hence will go to the good or the evil that is native to him, while those who return come as surely to their due. The trouble which had fallen on Bekuva did not leave her repentant, and the sweet lady began to do wrong as instantly and innocently as a flower begins to grow. It was she who was responsible for the ills which had come on Ireland. And we may wonder why she brought these plagues and droughts to what was now her own country. Actually, Nora, you have a very good um, point there. I should publish a book of jokes. I mean, they go down so well and people laugh so hilariously at them that I think, in fact, a book of jokes would do very, very well. To which Mavanway says, don't encourage him. <laughs> ah, yes, indeed. <laughs> Under all wrongdoing lies person sorry, under all wrongdoing lies personal vanity or the feeling that we are endowed and privileged beyond our fellows. It is probable that, however courageously she had accepted fate, Bekuva had been sharply stricken in her pride, in the sense of personal strength, aloofness, and identity, in which the mind likens itself to God and will resist every domination but its own she had been punished and that's a god complex i think they're talking about uh is it a uh, jungian or freudian uh uh psychology um before its time so, no because this was translated during the lifetime of the aforementioned I'm not sure how much scholarship they had published by that time anyway i digress she had been punished that is she had submitted to control and her sense of freedom, of privilege, of very being, was outraged. Yes, indeed, uh, as uh, that is the case with many women even today. The mind flinches even from the control of natural law, and how much more from the despotism of its own separated likenesses. For if another can control me, that other has usurped me, has become me, and how terribly I seem diminished by the seeming addition. Wow. This sense of separateness is vanity and is the bed of all wrongdoing. For we are not freedom, we are control, and we must submit to our own function ere we can exercise it. Even unconsciously, we accept the rights of others to all that we have. And if we will not share our good with them, it is because we cannot having none but we will yet give what we have, although that be evil. To insist on other people sharing in our personal torment is the first step towards insisting that they shall share in our joy, as we shall insist when we get it. Thank 
Yes, Nora is now sorry that she suggested the idea of a joke book. Well, I'm taking it seriously. Honestly, I am. Bekuva considered that if she must suffer all else, she must, she, sorry. Bekuva considered that if she must suffer, all else she met should suffer also. She raged, therefore, against Ireland. And in particular, she raged against young Art, her husband's son. And she left undone nothing that could afflict Ireland or the prince. She may have felt that she could not make them suffer, and that is a maddening thought to any woman. Or perhaps she had really desired the son instead of the father, and her thwarted desire had perpetuated itself as hate. But it is true that Art regarded his mother's successor with intense dislike, and it is true that she actively returned it. The evil stepmother trope coming in again. Uh, Karima, no, this is a sort of uh, a translation that takes a little bit of license with the language. Uh, but it is a beautiful translation. But uh, as I say, there is a, a certain amount of poetic license. One day, Bekuva came on the lawn before the palace and seeing that Art was at chess with Cromjes, she walked to the table on which the match was being played and for some time regarded the game. But the young prince did not take any notice of her while she stood by the board, for he knew that this girl was the enemy of Ireland, and he could not bring himself even to look at her. Bekuva, looking down on his beautiful head, smiled as much in rage as in disdain. Oh, son of a king, said she, I demand a game with you for stakes. No, folks, not beef stakes. Stakes, as in, you know, we'll stake certain things on the game. Did you hear about the uh, herd of cows that were accidentally um, uh, grazing on a field of cannabis? The stakes were high. Art then raised his head and stood up. Courtesy, no, I'm not laughing at my own joke. I rely on you guys for that. Art, Art then raised his head and stood up courteously, and he did not look at her. Whatever the, queen, the queen demands, I will do, said he. Am I not your mother also? She replied mockingly as she took the seat, which the chief magician leaped from. The game was set then, and her play was so skillful that Art was hard put to counter her moves. But at a point of the game, Bekuva grew thoughtful, and as by a lapse of memory, she made a move which gave the victory to her opponent. Thank you. Uh, lots of uh, funny faces going on there at the moment. Archaeostronomy Database wants to know if I made that up on the spot. No, in fact, that was one I had prepared earlier. <laughs> a well done steak. <laughs> oh, never mind. <laughs> but she had intended that. She sat then, biting on her lip with her white small teeth and staring angrily at Art. What do you demand from me? She asked. I bind you to eat no food in Ireland. Who said they were hungry? <laughs> I, do, I bind you to eat no food in Ireland until you find the wand of Kuri, son of Dara. Bekuva then put a cloak about her and she went from Tara northward and eastward until she, she came to the dewy, sparkling brew of Angus Machan Og in Ulster but she was not admitted there. She went thence to the she ruled over by uh, Ogoval, and although this lord would not admit her, his daughter Anya, who was her foster sister, let her into the she. <laughs> Tom King's calling for more. <laughs> While uh, <clears throat> John McHugh is putting up a warning. <laughs> I'm on fire tonight. Yes. Um, uh, the other day was the 1st of February uh, when we did, we did, oh, we did that one, didn't we? Yes. Uh, that The 1st of February, the date was 1222. Good day to test whether your microphone's working or not. Anyway, she made inquiries and was informed where the Dun of Kuri Makdara was. And when she had received this intelligence, she set out for Schlievmish. By what arts she coaxed Kuri to give up his wand, it matters not. 
enough that she was able to return in triumph to Tara. When she handed the wand to Art, she said, I claim my game of revenge. It is due to you, said Art, and they sat on the lawn before the palace and played. A hard game that was, and at times each of the combatants sat for an hour staring at the board before the next move was made. And at times they looked from the board for, and for hours stared on the sky, seeking as though in heaven for advice. But Bekuva's foster sister Anya came from the she, and unseen by any, she interfered with Art's play, so that suddenly, when he looked again on the board, his face went pale, for he saw that the game was lost. I didn't move that piece, he said sternly. Nor did I, Bekuva replied, and she called on the onlookers to confirm that statement. She was smiling to herself secretly, for she had seen what the mortal eyes around could not see. I think the game is mine, she insisted softly. I think that your friends in the she have cheated, he replied. But the game is yours if you are content to win it that way. I bind you, said Bekuva, to eat no food in Ireland until you have found Delvecane, the daughter of Morgan. Where do I look for her, said Art in despair. She is in one of the islands of the sea, Bekuva replied. That is all I will tell you. And she looked at him maliciously, joyously, contentedly, for she thought he would never return from that journey and that Morgan would see to it. And we are going on to chapter nine. There is a hair on the lens and I don't want to blow it in case I blow, uh, you know, a small droplet of spittle on the lens. So I'm get, going to get my magic lens blower. Now there's a first for a live stream. Blowing the dust off the camera lens. Live! Live on Live Irish Myths. Nothing gets cut out. Even, even the terrible jokes. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <clears throat> Brendan Byrne wants to know if the combatants were trading jokes by any chance. Well, uh, uh, Nora says perhaps. Jennifer says the signal is very bad. Jennifer, you're watching on Facebook. There seems to be a problem with the Facebook feed tonight. If you're able to go over to, sorry, uh, that's not you. Sorry. Uh, yes, Jennifer, go over to YouTube. Apparently the stream is very smooth on YouTube. Vanway says that is definitely a first for live Irish myths. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear it. I mean, you know, the stories are free and the entertainment is free. Where else would you get it? You know, now, the only thing is, whenever we do this in real person, at some point, there will be a gathering of the Tua and maybe I read a story. You will be able to throw fruit at me then. <laughs> ah, yes, yes, yes. Chapter 9. Art, as his father had done before him, set out for the many coloured land. But it was from Inverculpa he embarked, and not from Ben Ether. <laughs> Joan, you and I would argue over which is the better point of. Uh, uh, embarkation uh, that is the boy estuary or hoth <laughs> okay no more jokes people are apparently having cardiac issues and everything and uh, rolling around the stomach and knots and as um blackadder once said he said i thank god i wore my corset for i think my sides have just split at a certain time he passed from the rough green ridges of the sea to enchanted waters, and he roamed from island to island, asking people, asking all people how he might come to Delavcame, the daughter of Morgan. But he got no news from anyone until he reached an island that was fragrant with wild apples, gay with flowers, and joyous with the song of birds and the deep, mellow drumming of the bees. In this island, he was met by a lady, Craja, the truly beautiful. 
and when they ex had exchanged kisses, he told her who he was and on what errand he was bent. We have been expecting you, said Craigie, but alas, poor soul, it is a hard and a long bad way that you must go. For there is sea and land, danger and difficulty between you and the daughter of Morgan. Yet I must go there, he answered. There is a wild, dark ocean to be crossed. There is a dense wood, pardon me, where every thorn on every tree is sharp as a spear point and is curved and clutching. There is a deep gulf to be gone through, she said. A place of silence and terror, full of dumb, venomous monsters. There is an immense oak forest, dark and dairy, and dura, dense, dark, dense, thorny, a place to be strayed in, a place to be utterly bewildered and lost in. It sounds a little bit like Alice in Wonderland or something, doesn't it? Anthony will love that one. What what was what's that one? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Irish technical thinker. Did you hear what happened to the magic tractor? It turned into a field. <laughs> there is a vast dark wilderness, and therein is a dark house, lonely and full of echoes. And in it there are seven gloomy hags who are warned already of your coming and are waiting to plunge you in a bath of molten lead. Tom King uh, maybe could tell us what he thinks that might be like. It is not a choice journey, said Art, but I have no choice and must go. Should you pass those hags, she continued, and no one has yet passed them, by the by, <laughs> you must meet Eilil of the Black Teeth, the son of Mungon Tender Blossom. And who could pass that, who could pass that gigantic and terrible fighter? Sounds a little bit like uh, the escapades that uh, Setanta or Cuchulain had to go through when he met Skahawk, doesn't it? It is not easy to find the daughter of Morgan, said Art in a melancholy voice. It is not easy, Crager replied eagerly. And if you will take my advice, advise me, he broke in. For in truth, there is no man standing in such need of counsel as I do. I would advise you, said Crager in a low voice, to seek no more. For the sweet sweet daughter of Morgan, but to stay in this place where all that is lovely is at your service. But, but, cried Art in astonishment, am I not as sweet as the daughter of Morgan? She demanded. She stood before him queenly and pleadingly, and her eyes took his with imperious ten tenderness. By my hand, he answered, you are sweeter and lovelier than any being under the sun, but... And with me, she said, you will forget Ireland. I am under bonds, cried Art. I have passed my word, and I would not forget forget Ireland or cut myself from it for all the kingdoms of the many coloured land. Ah, his heart is in the right place. Craigie urged no more at that time, but as they were parting, she whispered, There are two girls, sisters of my own, in Morgan's palace. They will come to you with a cup in either hand. One cup will be filled with wine and one with poison. Drink from the right hand cup, oh my dear. And I'd be immediately asking, the one in her right hand, or if she's facing me, the one on my right. <laughs> Irish techno thinker was walking down the street last week and someone threw a block of cheese at him out their window. I shouted, yeah, that was mature. <laughs> It's like when I was in the supermarket and a man threw a block of cheese and a pint of milk at me. I thought, how dare he? <laughs> Art stepped into his coracle and then, wringing her hands, she made yet an attempt to dissuade him from that drear journey. Do not leave me, she urged. Do not affront those dangers. Around the palace of Morgan there is a palisade of copper spikes. And on the top of each spike, the head of a man grins and shrivels. There is one spike only which bears no head, and it is for your head that spike is waiting. Do not go there, my love. I must go indeed, said Art earnestly. There is yet a danger, she called. Beware of Del of Cain's mother, Doghead. <laughs> Daughter of the king of the Dogheads, 
beware of her. Indeed, said Art to himself. There is so much to beware of that I will beware of nothing. <laughs> I will go about my business, he said to the waves. And I will let those beings and monsters and the people of the dogheads go about their business. Well, you'd like to think, wouldn't you? But we shall see. John McHugh is in need of medication. Well, I recommend highly that, uh, well, how about a dram? A little drop of blue Bushmills, maybe? Angel Barboni is in the house. Hello there, Angel. You're very welcome and uh, good afternoon to you indeed. Ah, yes, yes, yes. We are on to the last chapter. This is chapter 10. I'll go slow because I know you like a good story. And I, I know you like this sort of slight added dimension of drama. You know that there's a bit of a thespian in me that this is almost a Shakespearean delivery of this performance. <laughs> Mavanway, I hope you weren't talking about that when you said, oh my God, jokes on all fronts here. Ah, oh, yes, indeed. Why was the skeleton sad at the disco? Because he had no body to go with. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take a sip of water. And it's all it is, it's water. Chapter 10. He went forward in his light bark and at some moment found that he had parted from those seas and was adrift on, on vaster and more turbulent billows. From those dark green surges there gaped at him monstrous and cavernous jaws and round, wicked, red-rimmed, bulging eyes stared fixedly at the boat. A ridge of inky water rushed foaming mountainously on to, on his board, and behind that ridge came a vast warty head that gurgled and groaned. But at these vile creatures he thrust with his lengthy spear, excuse me, or stabbed at closer reach with a dagger. He was not spared one of the terrors which had been foretold. Thus, in the dark, thick oak forest, he slew the seven hags and buried them in the molten lead, which they had heated for him. He climbed an icy mountain, the cold breath of which seemed to slip into his body and chip off the inside of his bones. And there, until he mastered the sort of climbing on ice, for each step that he took upwards, he slipped back ten steps. Sounds like a drunk Irishman coming home from the pub. I mean, do you know, it's a funny thing, but when I go to the pub, it takes me 10 minutes to walk there, but it takes me three hours to walk home. The difference is staggering. <laughs> Sorry. Right, that's enough. That's my last one. No more jokes. I, I, I promise. <laughs> ah, I promise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Almost his heart gave way before he learned to climb that venomous hill. In a forked glen into which he slipped at nightfall, he was surrounded by giant toads, yes, toads, who spat poison and were icy as the land they lived in and were cold and foul and savage. At Schlieve Sive, he encountered the long-maned lions who lie in wait for the beasts of the world growling woefully as they squat above their prey and crunch those terrified bones. <laughs> Michael Pike, I fear that the, the meat of the last joke is but lean. <laughs> ah, thank you, Janet. Janet thought that was the best joke of the day. The difference is staggering. Mavanway asks a very interesting question. The story of Bekuva is the same one that we read before. It's called Achtre. Art McCoyned, or in English, The Adventures of Art, Son of Con. Uh, where does it come from? That is a question that I can't immediately answer. Uh, but I will find out the answer for you. 
absolutely. <sighs> yes. One moment. Quick Google search might actually act three art. Like, couldn't. Old spellings are sort of funny. Art McCon is the principal figure of the adventure story called Echtre Art McQuinn or McQuinn. Yeah, I don't see the source though. Oh yes, the Van Hamel website is brilliant. Codex.vanhamel.nl is brilliant for finding out where everything is. So uh, there's a translation by uh, Best uh, 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 Best and Richard Irvine, The Adventures of Art, Son of Con, and the Courtship of Del of Cain, Eru 3, 1907. Uh, I think I have Eru 3 there. Which may be the one that I read it from before. Uh, let me just quickly see if there's any indication of where it's from. I'm sorry. I know. I'm going down a rabbit hole here. I like going down rabbit holes. The Adventures of uh, Art, Son of Con. Oh, yeah. That's almost certainly the one I read from because it's got so full of uh, margin notes. The following curious tale, which is now edited for the first time, taken from the well-known book of Fermoy, is a codex of the 15th century in the Royal Irish Academy. So there you go. There's the original source. I can't remember who was asking. Um, was that Mavanway that asked? Um, Mavanway, it was indeed, yes. Well, there you go. Uh, it's from the book of Fermoy, which is a 15th century manuscript very glad to have helped and if you want to read the scholarly translation that is without the literary flourishes that james stevens beautifully engages and i have to say that we have loved his book so much that we've read almost the whole thing and i will read it all the way to the end because the next story is uh, morgan's frenzy which we will read in the coming episodes that will probably take two or three episodes and it has been the most wonderful journey however if you want the scholarly uh, translation which is a very literal translation without the flourishes, then you're looking for Eru Volume 3, 1907. Now, this is one of these um, facsimile reprints that are available on the internet, much cheaper than you would pay for a copy of the original. Hope that helps. Sorry. I'm trying to do... do, 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 do. No need to apologise for sending me down that rabbit hole, uh, Mavanway. Always glad to go down rabbit holes. I love that. That's one of the beautiful things about having this library. It really is. I am so privileged and honoured and delighted that when I get my teeth stuck into something, I'm like, OK, I need to follow that. Van Hamel is brilliant for showing you the sources. Quite often I have it here. If not, you'll find that the earlier sources, as in early 20th, late 19th and early 20th century sources, are available on archive.org and such websites for free as downloadable pdfs um so you nearly have it all at your fingertips now something that we didn't have 20 years ago just when i started out on this journey i had to go to the libraries not that there's anything wrong with going to the library but it's just far more convenient just to reach back as i just did there and grab Eru volume three instead of having to find out which of the libraries it's in and go there uh, someday Anyway, we were talking about the long-maned lions who were waiting, lying in wait. He came on Eileel of the Black Teeth. He doesn't say what happened when he came upon the lions. Hmm. Maybe he just walked past them and they didn't do anything. He came on Eileel of the Black Teeth, sit, sitting on the bridge that spanned a torrent, and the, the grim giant was grinding his teeth on a pillar stone. Art drew nigh, unobserved, and brought him low. I think you might be right, Brendan Byrne. I think you might be right. An, an evening of hilarity and, you know, st st stupid silliness and people having a good laugh. Because, you know, 
we haven't been able to do it for two years, get together and tell stories and crack jokes, if that's what you call my attempts at humour. It was not for nothing that these difficulties and dangers were in his path. These things and creatures were the invention of Doghead, the wife of Morgan. <laughs> Somebody mentioned Anubis earlier on. For it had become known to her that she would die on the day her daughter was wooed. Therefore, none of the dangers encountered by Art were real, but were magical chimeras conjured against him by the great witch. Wow. A little bit like Balor, who kept his daughter, Ethne, locked in a tower on Tory Island because the prophecy said that his own he would be vanquished and killed by his own grandson. Wow, great stuff. Affronting all, conquering all, he came in time to Morgan's Dunn. A place so lovely that after the miseries through which he had struggled, he almost wept to see beauty again. Jellof came, knew that he was coming. She was waiting for him, yearning for him. To her mind, Art was not only love, he was freedom. For the poor girl was a captive in her father's home. A great pillar, a hundred feet high, had been built on the roof of Morgan's palace. And on the top of this pillar, a tiny room had been constructed. And in this room, Jellof came was a prisoner. Snapper Earl says, airfare has become very reasonable from my area to Ireland, so I'm available. Brilliant stuff. Summertime, definitely. Gemma McGowan is... Uh, yes, Gemma, everybody's suffering from a bad Facebook connection tonight, so YouTube is definitely the place to watch. But a uh, very good evening to you. I hope you're well. She was lovelier... <clears throat> Sorry, did I read that? Yes, yes, yes. And in this room, Jellof came was a prisoner. She was lovelier in shape than any other prince princess of the many-coloured land. She was wiser than all the other women of that land. And she was skillful in music, embroidery, and chastity, and in all else that pertained to the knowledge of a queen. Although Jellof came's mother wished nothing but ill to art, she yet treated him with the courtesy proper in a queen on the one hand and fitting towards the son of the king of ireland on the other therefore when art entered the palace he was met and kissed and he was bathed and clothed and fed two young girls came to him then then having a cup in each of their hands and presented him with the kingly drink but remembering the warning which Craja had given him he said hang on i have to take the one is it your right hand or my right hand Do you know which one has got the poison no that's not what he really said but remembering the warning which Craja had given him, he drank only from the right-hand cup and escaped the poison. Next, he was visited by Jell of Kame's mother, Doghead, daughter of the King of the Dogheads and Morgan's Queen. She was dressed in full armour and she challenged Art to fight with her. It was a woeful combat, for there was no craft or sagacity no unknown to her. Sagacity, sagaciousness is uh, uh, awareness, isn't it? And Art would infallibly have perished by her hand, but that her days were numbered. Her star was out and her time had come. It was her head that rolled on the ground when the combat was over, and it was her head that grinned and shriveled on the vacant spike which she had reserved for Art's. Then Art liberated Jellof came from her prison at the top of the pillar and they were affianced together. But the ceremony had scarcely been completed when the tread of a single man caused the palace to quake and seemed to jar the world. It was Morgan returning to the palace. That sounds nice. Come here, listen, when we do get together, bring some of that with you in a bottle now, because we'll want to have a taste now and make sure that it's decent stuff. Do you hear me now? <laughs> oh geez i really look forward to it of course if you're coming to a, a live mythflix gathering in person definitely definitely uh you won't be uh you won't be driving your own car home and in fact it's just better off uh, to book a place for the night because a few drinks will probably be had let's be honest the gloomy king challenged him to combat also and in his honor art put the battle harness put on the battle harness which he had brought from ireland he wore a breastplate and helmet of gold, a mantle of blue satin swung from his shoulders. His left hand was thrust into the grips of a purple shield, deeply, <laughs> pardon me, sorry about that, deeply bossed with silver. And in the other hand, he held the wide grooved blue hilted sword, which had rung so often in fights and combats and joyous feats and exercises. 
Up to this time, the trials through which he had passed had seemed so great that they could not easily be added to. But if all those trials had been gathered into one vast calamity, they would not equal one half of the rage and catastrophe of his war with Morgan. <laughs> Joan, I'm a bottle or 20. I, I don't know. You know, whatever you have. You're, oh, sorry. Nora is pointing out it's a barrel. ITT, Irish Technical Thinker, a barrel. Yes, indeed. Don't just bring a bottle, bring a barrel. Yes. Or several barrels, you know. And when we're finished drinking the stuff, we can roll down the hill of Tara in the barrels. Or play chess. For what he could not effect by arms, Morgan would endeavour by guile, so that while Art drove at him or parried a crafty blow, the shape of Morgan changed before his eyes and the monstrous king was having at him in another form and from a new direction. It was well for the son of the Ardry. He doesn't fight like a boy band. He doesn't come from one direction. <clears throat> it is well for the son of the Ardry that he had been beloved by the poets and magicians of his land and that they had taught him all that was known of shape changing and words of power. He had need of all these. We're nearly done. What time? Oh my God. So look. If it wasn't for the jokes, we'd be done already. <clears throat> At times, for the weapon must change with the enemy, they fought with their foreheads as two giant stags. And the crash of their monstrous onslaught rolled and lingered on the air <clears throat> long after their skulls had parted. Then, as two lions, long-clawed, deep-mouthed, snarling, with rigid mane, with red-eyed glare, with flashing sharp white fangs, they prowled lithely about each other, seeking for an opening. And then, as two green-ridged, white-topped, broad-swung, overwhelming, vehement billows of the deep, they met and crashed and sank into and rolled away from each other. And the noise of these two waves was as the roar of all ocean when the howl of the tempest is drowned in the league-long fury of the surge. I don't know about you, but I just think James Stevens is fabulous when it comes to uh, poetic prose. It's wonderful stuff. <laughs> it just did kind of sound a little bit like Hobbiton. The wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins, nor is he early. That sounds like a plan, Joan. But when the wife's time has come, the husband is doomed. He is required elsewhere by his beloved, and Morgan went to rejoin his queen in the world that comes after the many-coloured land and his victor shore that knowledgeable head away from its giant shoulders. He did not tarry in the many-coloured land, for he had nothing further to seek there. He gathered the things which pleased him best from among the treasures of its grisly king, and with Jellof came by his side, they stepped into the coracle. Then, setting their minds on Ireland, they went there, as it were, in a flash. The waves of all the worlds seemed to whirl past them in one huge green cataract. The sound of all these oceans boomed in their ears for one eternal instant. That's amazing. An eternal instant. Wow. Enoch Mythflix. I like that, Greenhearted 77. Yes, indeed. Just Be Kind is up for that. Marge does agree that it is gorgeous writing and it is fabulous, isn't it? Nothing was for that moment but a vast roar and pour of waters. Thence they swung into a silence equally vast and so sudden that it was as thunderous in the comparison as was the elemental rage they quitted. For a time they sat panting, staring at, at each other holding each other, lest not only their lives, but their very souls should be swirled away in the gusty passage of world within world. And then, 
Looking abroad, they saw the small bright waves creaming by the rocks of Ben Ether, and they saw Joan waving from the clifftops. And they blessed the power that had guided and protected them, and they blessed the comely land of Ear. On reaching Tara, Jelov came, who was more powerful in art and magic than Bekuva, ordered the latter to go away, and she did so. She left the king's side. She came from the midst of the counsellors and magicians. She did not bid farewell to anyone. She did not say goodbye to the king as she set out for Ben Ether. Where she could go to, no man knew, for she had been banished from the many-coloured land and could not return there. She was forbidden entry to the she by Angus Og, and she could not remain in Ireland. She went to Sasna, and she became a queen in that country, and it was she who fostered the rage against the Holy Land, which has not ceased to this day. Creek. Toshe Creek, na. And the only story that's left, uh, Shkelawan, Morgan's Frenzy, which looks like it will take two episodes to read. So, still more James Stevens to come. Joan McHugh, yes, you said it, and I believed you. Don't worry. You did indeed tell us that it was based around Hoth. Ben Ether. Oh, oh, John, I don't have the lovely shins of old. Did I interrupt a conversation there? Perhaps I should just, uh, just, just have kept, kept reading. Anyway, uh, that is our story for this evening. As I say, also known as Echtre Art McQuinn, uh, The Adventures of Art, Son of Con, which I want to read the scholarly version of again. Actually, let's just go to the very end of that. So this is the scholarly version of the last couple of paragraphs. The stewards and overseers followed him from the land, and he brought the maiden with him to Ireland, and they landed at Ben Ether. When they came into port, the maiden said, Hasten to Tara and tell to Bekuva, daughter of Owen, that she not abide there, but to depart at once, for it is a bad hap if she be for it is a bad hap if she be commanded to leave Tara. And Art went forward to Tara and was made welcome, and there was none to whom his coming was not pleasing but the wanton and sorrowful Bekuva. But Art ordered the sinful woman to leave Tara, and she rose up straight away, lamenting in the presence of the men of Ireland, without a word of leave-taking, until she came to Ben Ether. As for the maiden Jellof came, the seers and the wise men and the chiefs were sent to welcome her, and they came to Tara luckily and auspiciously. And the nobles of Ireland asked tidings of the adventures from Art, and he answered them and made a lay. And uh, yeah, that is pretty much the end of it. So, it, you know, you can see that Stevens' uh, translation is reasonably faithful to the original with some uh, uh, ni a nice uh, literary additions. Yes, uh, Joan, and I would encourage you in that effort. Absolutely. A book about the mythology associated with Hoth and Ben Ether. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And McCallum, enjoyed the night. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night, everyone. Stay safe and warm. And the same right back at you, Anne. Hope you have a great time in uh, Ontario and that it's not too cold and snowy. But Vanway says it's all happening on YouTube. Yes, indeed. Uh, not on Facebook, it seems. Um, Silvius prefers the non-scholarly version. It's really beautiful. Yeah. So long as it doesn't, you know, add detail. It can add descriptive language. But so long as it doesn't add detail that's not in the original, then that's fair enough, you know. Daisy Peters had to go, I see, a few minutes ago. That's all right, Daisy. No problem. Sure, look, um, we'll see you uh, on the next one. Wayne Bird can't wait for the next episode. Well, that's always good to hear because most people are like, oh, geez, do we have to watch this? Can you not just tell the story without trying to be funny? And no, the truth is I can't. So sorry. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Joan uh, is having a ball tonight. Very glad to hear it. Downright balmy in Ontario, where it is one degree Celsius, according to Sheila Gunn. Oh, dear. And Irish Technical Thinker is suggesting that Mark Zuckerberg is Balor. Yes, indeed. The Fomorians trying to ruin our, ruin our fun. Well, they didn't manage, did they? Don't forget the clean version. The clean. <laughs> the uh, the unstuttering 
Smooth's playing streaming version is on YouTube. You have managed to band a strange band of warriors together. Yes. Oh, look, Sherlock, if you can't have a bit of fun, like, you know, life is too serious as it is. So it's nice to have a bit of crack, isn't it? Don't forget, anyway, you could be within a chance of winning this 500 euros from Bridget's Cross made by this man here, Tom King on Goa. Order one of his creations on the Mythical Ireland website to be in the free draw. But don't forget. There are only seven of these left now because one was ordered during the live stream. The last seven copies of New Grange Monument Immortality, which is not being reprinted. That will be it. The only place you'll be able to get them is secondhand bookshops and on secondhand book websites. Get your signed copy before they're all gone. And don't forget, please, to consider, do consider becoming a patron and support the work of Mythical Ireland. I would be very, very grateful if you would do that. And it does, does, does make a lot of things happen. Anyway, as I say in ham radio terminology, 7-3. Uh, I'm QRT for the moment, or QRX if you like. We'll be back soon with more. In the meantime, have a very good evening or good morning if you're in Australia or good afternoon if you're in North or South America or in Canada. Hope we see you very, very soon. Don't forget to keep an eye on the uh, Facebook page and the YouTube channel. There's always something happening. And every day there's posts on uh, the Mythical Ireland community on Facebook. And I'm glad to report that that community is now over 18,000 strong. Can you believe it? It's growing wonderfully. And uh, yeah, if you missed it, uh, those of you, there's a few people here tonight who haven't been here before. Uh, on the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel are all the previous episodes, all 166 of them. Uh, you will enjoy also the live Irish Myths in Conversation series. The last one we had was last week with Tom King uh, at his forge. And uh, that's uh, uh, almost three hours long. Uh, and I think you'll enjoy every moment of it as I did. Um, so there's tons and tons of stuff, hundreds upon hundreds of hours of watching and viewing and listening. And uh, if you don't like to listen and watch, you can read instead. There's lots of stuff on the Mythical Ireland website. There's lots of stuff in the books as well. So don't forget. Uh, support the work of the author and buy yourself a signed copy. Good night, everyone. All the very best. See you next time. Ikhawa Kulasov. Slonga Fol. August Togabugay.